because uh, right now we're in a series on the Christian, who the Christian is. I said this last week and I will say it today. I am not assuming any of you is a Christian. Okay? A lot of people that go to church are not believers. They were born in the church. Um, before the church is open, they are the first there and they don't know Jesus. So I am not making any assumption that because you're here right now, you love Jesus. So I am going to speak to you about who a Christian is. And I want you to ask yourself whether this is you. Okay? Um, so we're talking about the Christian values. What are the Christian values? Now, I'm going to read something quickly to start this, and then we'll dive into it. Uh, as I was getting ready for this message, I came across a little uh, note from a, a psychology website, psychology and business website, and it just has like a quote I, I thought was interesting. It says, there's a difference between the things you value and your actual values. Okay? There's a difference between the things you value and your actual values. Okay? The former comes and goes. So the things you value, you are not consistent in them. Because many times you may, you may value them in somebody else. It doesn't mean that you would do them. It says, but your values can guide, your, your, can, guide, can guide you throughout your life, no matter the situation. In the end, you have a better, in the end, you have a better measuring stick. Now, this is what they wrote there, which I thought was interesting. It says, real failure is failing to live by your values. And real success is taking action every day to embody them. Okay? So, I have some questions this morning. What are those things that are important enough to you that they shape your very approach to life? Many of us, right, we value patience. Are you patient? You value, but you value patience when somebody else, you want them to be patient in regards to you, right? You, or you value the concept of patience. Many of us value the concept of love. Are we loving? We like the idea and the concept of love. We want to receive it. And we think we give it, but are we really there? You know, a, a, a brother was saying something the other day, which I thought was interesting. He says, a lot of people think they are patient, right? They'll wait for an hour, then after that, they will lose their patience. But then they will look down at the person that was patient for only 30 minutes. Because they were 30 minutes better than them. And then they go, well, I am patient. No, you are just a little bit more patient. Does that make sense? Okay, many times, we love certain things. It doesn't mean we live by those things. I have something here in my notes. Now. Let me read this, and we'll jump into the word. It says, many times we claim to have values, but they are optional and change based on the environment and the response of people. Your actual values don't change, but you can value something that changes. Does that make sense? So, for example, let's say I value patience, right? Or I value, uh, you know... Yeah, I value patience. But then, depending on my environment and the situation, I might be pushed to the brink and I lose that patience, right? So then, there's a concept in my head that I value this and I think this is so important, but I can't live by the things I value, you know? Or someone could value, let's say, um, give me one value that you guys have. One value. I want to hear from you. One value. Just someone throw something out. What's one thing that you value? Aha, beautiful. That's good. Now, here's the funny thing. That's one of my values. That's one of my values. Now, a lot of people can say they value punctuality, right? But they're only punctual for certain things. If they go to a Nigerian party, they're late. Because they assume it will start late. Now, you've got to ask yourself, is that a value that I hold 100%? Or is that a value that... Is that my actual value? Is that a value, something that I value? You value it, but it's not your act. Because if it's your actual value, you will be there on time regardless of whatever, whatever they do. Because the point is, it's not based off of them, it's you. This is what pushes you to do this thing. So you will show up on time because you love being punctual. All right, cool. Now, everything I've seen so far, I have spoken from the perspective of the world. Even though it sounds good for the Christians. And let's look at what the Christian actually values. Let's go to the book of Acts. Acts 5. 
This morning, I will challenge you with the word. And all I ask is this. Don't make an excuse for yourself. Ask yourself, is this me? Don't excuse yourself. Don't Because many times you hear the word and people excuse themselves in the middle of the, oh, well, you know. Don't tell yourself you know. Just ask yourself, is this me? Acts 5 verse 17. So we're going to use three examples from the new and three examples from the old. Because I want to make sure that we see that this is a biblical value. It says, but the high priest rose up and all who were with them, that is the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in public prison. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, verse 20, Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. So in the middle of the night, they were in prison. They were rescued from prison by the angel of God. Then they were sent right out to the thing that put them in prison to go redo it. Now let's continue. It says, now when the high priest came, so this we're in verse 21. When the high priest came and those who were with him, they called together the council and all the senate of the people of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. So they're, they're trying to now speak to the people or, you know, they thought they were in prison, so they want to put them on trial pretty much. But when the, officer, when the officers came, they did not find them in the prison, so they returned and reported. Now, let me stop there quickly and say this guy. You realize I didn't say this at the beginning. Uh, for those of you that are new to the Way Fellowship, welcome. Uh, we put the passages up. We actually put the verses and the chapters up, but we don't put the passages for you to read. Open your own Bible. Okay? Many times when you open your own Bible, there are things that you will see that I'm not even talking about. Are you following me? There are some things that you might see that go, ooh, this is, this is, this is, this is interesting. But, but when you just read what we put up there, you're just only following what we're talking about right now. Okay? Are you all still with me? Okay. Let's continue. All right, and it says, now verse 22, and when the officers came, they did not find them in the prison, so they returned and reported. Now verse 23, we found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the doors. And when we opened them, we found no one inside. The guards are out there, but there's nobody in the door. There's nobody in the prison. And it, the doors were not open. Now look at verse 24. Now, when the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them. I'm wondering what, what this would come to. And someone came and told them, look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and preaching and teaching the people. Verse 26. Then the captains with the officers went and brought them, but not by force for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, we strictly charged you not to teach in this name. Yet here you are filled, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Now verse 29. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than what? Men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on the tree, on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. Verse 32. And we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit which God has given to those who obey him. So now they got mad, they wanted to kill them. Right? So then they got uh, one of the, those in the council called Gamaliel, you know, spoke to them and said, hey, maybe we shouldn't kill these people now. And it's right there. You can keep reading it as I'm just giving a summary of what's happening after. Maybe we shouldn't kill them because guess what? If they are from God, we don't want to be on, uh, against God. But if they're not from God, they, their message will die off, right? It, there's no way it will last. That's what he says. So now let's go to 39. But if it is God, you will not be able to cover, overthrow, overthrow them. 
you might even be found opposing God. It says, so they took his advice, right? Now look at verse 40. And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them. I thought they took his advice. But they brought the apostles and they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and then they let them go. Now look at verse 41. And when they left the presence of the council, it says, then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that Christ is Jesus. So Christ is just the Messiah, right? The Messiah is, is Jesus. So what you see, they were saved from prison, set out. They were instructed to continue preaching exactly. <laughs> they were instructed to keep preaching in the exact same place that got them in prison, right? So then... They were beaten, but their response to being beaten is what? What does your Bible say? Rejoicing. Their response to be beaten is rejoicing. Why? Because they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for his name. Let's go to Acts 14. So, What does the Christian value? Acts 14, 19 to 22. We're so far away from this word that sometimes when somebody would tell you what the word of God says, it sounds like Chinese. It sounds like, for someone that doesn't speak Chinese, it sounds weird. It's like, what are you talking about? It sounds so different. It's not because the word of God doesn't say this. It's not because it's not who the Christian is. It's just because you are not that person. So now all of a sudden you are wondering, how? That's not what I've learned all my life. But that's what the word has been teaching all your life. You just never saw it. Okay. 14. Are we there? Verse 19. Are we there? Okay. But, but it says, but Jews came from Antioch and... Iconum, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city. And on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Dirk. It says, when they had preached the gospel to that city and had made disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium. And to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. So they stoned this man to, (laughs) in their mind, they think he died, right? So in their mind, they think they stoned him to death. The disciples came around him. Then his scripture says that he rose up. He was still in pain, though. I, I don't think he rose up and there was no more pain. But what does scripture say? He rose up and he entered the city. I says, and on the next day, he went somewhere else to go preach. Then when it was done, what did he do? He came right back to where they stoned him. Then he went to the city of the people who came to come stone him. Let's go to Acts 7. And there are a lot of this, right? The reason why I want to use examples because I could give you just what the word says in regards to the words that an apostle says, right? I want to show you the life that they lived. Because sometimes it's better to see the life that people live and ask yourself, what is wrong with me? It's okay to ask yourself that question. What is wrong with me? Because if you have the same Christianity that they had, Why are we so different? If we have the same faith that they have, the same Holy Spirit that they have, why are we so different? What is wrong with us? Acts 7. Let's look at verse 58. Acts 7, verse 58. Verse 58 to 60. 
All right. <laughs> um, okay. So, well, well, well let's, let's, let's go. Let's start from verse 54. Let's start from verse 54. Sorry. So this is Stephen, right? Some of us know the story, but I want you to look at it. Open your Bibles and look at it. It's interesting. Now, when they heard these things, it says they were enraged. Because, okay, at this point, if you don't know, Stephen had just preached a mean sermon, right? This sermon was not nice. <laughs> this sermon was calling people like, you know, hypocrites and calling them different things and telling them, like, listen, they killed the Messiah. And he's trying to show them that this, the one they killed is the Christ that has come to save them. He's telling them that their fathers killed the prophets before Jesus. And they've done the same thing as their fathers. That's what, that's what Stephen died, did. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. So when it was, when it was done, look at verse 54. It says, now, when they heard these things, they were enraged. It's not just, they were not just angry, right? The kind of anger that they had was different. You know, it's kind of anger, you know, that someone would just break things in their house. And, uh, and you know, terrible anger. It says they were enraged. And they ground their teeth at him. <laughs> All right. You know, the kind of anger that makes you just, Argh! Now look at 55. It says, but he... So they were angry, they were enraged, but it says, but he, full of the what? Holy Spirit, gazed into the heavens. So they were angry, they were, but he is looking at the one that he serves. Gazed into the heavens and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Now verse 57. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears. They don't want to hear the message anymore. And they rushed him. It says, and they rushed together and laid down their garments at the, at the feet of a young man called Saul, who we know became Apostle Paul. And as they were stoning Stephen, so this is the ministry of the stone. They were not done. They were, the stone was coming. It said, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice. This is the final thing he said before he died. Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. They were stoning this man to death. He's praying for the people killing him. Lord, don't hold this sin against them. Is that you? <laughs> if somebody slaps you, can you pray for them? We're never talking about stoning to death. A little smack in the face. Do you pray like, Lord, for forgive this person? They don't know what they've done. You know what's so funny about this prayer? There's something else in this prayer that we don't understand. The word of God tells us, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Right here, Stephen is saying, Lord, don't have that vengeance. Difference. He's telling God not to do what God will automatically do. He's saying, God, have mercy on them. Now we know, we know Saul was there, right? Saul now becomes... Is this you? What does the Christian value? Is this you? Okay. Let's go to the old. We ready? Genesis. Let's go to the book of Genesis. Genesis 39. Genesis 39, verse 6. Genesis 39, verse 6. Okay, now this is a story that some of you already know. And if you know the story, great. You, you can still read it. If you don't know the story, great. You can still read it. So it says, so he left all that he had in Joseph's... Now, let me give you just uh, context of this thing. Joseph has been sold uh, pretty much to Egypt. 
And at this point, he's in, this, in the house of Potiphar, right, who's one of the rulers of Egypt or one of the, you know, big men in Egypt. Let's put it that way. Okay, let's continue. So he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. This is Potiphar, in Joseph's charge. And because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. So now, Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. When scripture says you are handsome, you are handsome. Scripture does not even say that Jesus is handsome, but it talks about Joseph. It says Joseph was handsome. There's a different level. There's looking good and handsome in scripture. Anyway, let's go. I'm just joking. All right, it says, number seven. It says, and after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, lie with me. You see, now we... We understand why scripture tells you he was handsome. So she cast, because guess what? He was good looking. He was probably a tall brother, you know? <laughs> he was probably. <laughs> anyway, you know, some of us, uh, you know, we are, we are trying to get there. <laughs> anyway, let's continue. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right. And he says, Verse 7, and after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, lie with me. So very direct. She knows exactly what she wants. Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house. And he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am. Nor has he kept back anything from me except you. Because you are his wife. And then, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against my master? Huh? Okay, thank you. If you were reading your Bible, you should notice that that's not what he said. He said, and sin against who? God. He first of all says, my master has given me all the charge. But then he says, how can I do I sin against God? But let's continue. And as she spoke to Joseph, how many times? Day after day. This was not a one-time temptation. This woman was coming on Joseph every day. Hi. I just like, um, I'm still good. Every day. Every day. Some of us expect to be tempted once and overcome and we think it's enough. Every day. Now, you know what's interesting? What greater treasure is there in the house than having the master's wife? That's the, you're already the head, right? You really become the head. But let's continue. And then it says, And she spoke to Joseph day after day. He would not listen to her to lie beside her or to be with her. But one day when he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house was there in the house, she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. Now, we've said this before, right? And we said it uh, when we're talking about Father of Lights, right, here. Sin loves darkness. Your sin loves darkness. This is why typically when people really, they want to make sure they are, other people are not there. Or the people that are there agree with their sin. Because your sin likes darkness. So guess what? When there were no men there, then she's like, okay, today's the day. Right? There's no other person. It's just me and this boy. Now, let's continue. She caught him by his garment, saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. And as soon as she saw that he had left his garment in, in her hand and fled out of the house, verse 14, who called? She called. They didn't find out. It wasn't something like Joseph went to go snitch on her. She called. I want you to understand, because there's something here I want you to see. She called. It says, she called to the men of her household and said to them, see, he has brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. He came to me to lie with me, but I cried out with a loud voice. And as soon as he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried out, he left his garment be beside me and fled and got out of the house. Then she laid up his garment by her until his master came home. She told him the same story, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you have brought among us came into me to laugh at me. And as soon as I lifted up my voice and cried, 
he left his garment beside me and fled out of the house. As soon as his master heard the words that his wife had spoken, this is the way, okay, so his wife has spoken to him. This is the way your servant treated me. His anger was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him in the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in prison. Question, why, did she just, why, didn't, why didn't he just kill him? If you think about it, this is Egypt, right? He's a Jew, right? What right does he have? He was a slave. He wanted to stay with him. Why don't you just behead you? So, you know, first of all, if he was beheaded, God's plan would not come to pass. But I want you to understand that on the journey to God's plan, he had to be in prison. But why was he in prison? Because he did the right thing. Why was he in prison? Because, because he did the right thing, a woman lied on his name that he did the right thing. Okay. Still have two more, but time is running out. Time is running out. <laughs> Daniel 2. Because I, 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 want, I want us to see what a Christian value is. It is so different from what the world says. Because like I said before, there's, this, there's a thing that you value and then there's your actual value. Daniel 2, let's see. Verse 49. It says, Daniel made a request to the king and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel remained in the king's court. Right? Stay with me. Okay, now let's go to chapter 3 of the same passage, okay? And let's start from verse 13. So this is another long one. We're going to read it through because I need you to see it. I need you to see it. Daniel 3 from verse 13. Actually, let's start from verse 8. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live Forever, you, O king, has made you have made a decree. So at this point, the king created a statue and decreed that everyone must worship it. Simple, and you can see that from from verse one of uh, Daniel three. And then it says, "So let's go all the way down to 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought because the three Hebrew boys refused to bow to this idol. So you had some people that went and they snitched on them." Are we seeing a thing? So they brought this man before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Then he tells them, Now when you hear the sound of the harp, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp bag, and then he says, I want you to bow. If you don't bow, and this is a summary of that to verse 15, it says, I will cast you into the furry furnace. Now, I want you to see how he phrases this at the end of 15. And who is the God who would deliver you out of my hands? Okay? Stay with me? Okay. Now, look at their response, verse 16. What does the Christian value? Theodra, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hands, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we will not serve the gods, your gods, or worship the golden image that you have set up. Now, when you continue reading, you find out that the king was enriched. Tell them to increase the flame. You know, make it the highest. And then they cast all of them with, their, with everything they were wearing. They didn't, they didn't, no, they shot everything, their hats. They bound them and threw them into the flame. Even the men that threw them into the flame died because the flame was so hot. And the king asked them to do it urgently so they didn't plan for, okay, how are we going to do it safely? <laughs> they cast them in. The men that threw them in died. Now, 
Of course, when you read the story, you find out that the three Hebrew boys did not die, right? Many of us, that's the message that we got from this. Oh yeah, you see, they were delivered. I want you to understand that that is not the only message here. There is much more. So let's look at their response. Verse 18, what do they say? They say what? If not, let it be known to your king that we will not serve your gods or worship the good image that you have set up. They are saying, and I want you to hear this clearly. Listen, we are not worshiping God because he can save us from your fire. Whether he saves us or not, we will not bow to any other idol but him. He is the God that we worship. So regardless of whether we are saved or not, changes nothing. Many of you are worshiping God because of something that you were promised that he will do for you in this life. So you're going, well, the God, they are saying, we know he can, and he will save us. So they are not doubting, but they are saying, even if he chooses not to, we're good. Because that is not why we worship him. So we will not now trade him for anything else that you have to offer. Because he is God. Is God a genie to you? You rub the lamp and the genie comes up. You make your three wishes and you rub it back in. What does the Christian value? Now, here's what's interesting about this. After they were saved, let's go all the way down. He says, let's look at the end of 27. And no smell of fire had come upon them. Now verse 28. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angels and delivered his servants who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. It says, therefore, I make a decree. I want you to understand, the actions that they took made a worldly king glorify God. You follow me? The actions that it took made a worldly king glorify God. Now, I guess my question to you is this. The life that you are living, who is glorified? The choices you are making, who is glorified? What is the Christian value? All right, I was going to read one more, but we're running out of time, so I'm going to read two more passages that have nothing to do with this. Let's go to the book of Matthew. No, I was going to read one more story. Yeah, so I saw someone doing your face like, huh? I just say it's going to read one more. It's okay. I need you to get this. I, 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 can, I can't leave it this way. Matthew 14. Actually, Matthew 16, 23. I want you to see it. I, now we're going to answer the question, what does the Christian value? I've been asking questions all through, right? Showing you different examples, right? Let's answer the question now. What does the Christian value? Verse 23, Matthew 16, 23. He says, well, let's start from verse 24. He says, then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life would lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Then look at verse 26, because a lot of us know 26. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? 2 Timothy 4. 2 Timothy 4. And this is the final passage today. Are you trying to save your life? What do you value in this life? Are you trying to save your life? Are you trying to make sure that you're okay? You're protected. You're safe. Everything is fine with you, regardless of what God has said. Joseph could have easily, easily slept with Potiphar's wife. Because it will ensure his position. Right? He wouldn't get in trouble in that sense. But he chose to listen to the word of God. 
And guess what, what did he get for it? He was thrown into prison. He wasn't congratulated. Potiphar didn't clap for him. He was thrown into prison. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego chose not to bow before him, and they were thrown into the fire. We see Stephen preaching a sermon that he was given, and what happened? He was stoned to death. Paul, Peter, preached, and what happened afterwards? They all suffered, right? Okay. So now let's look at this. And this is, uh, we're going to round up, I know, five more minutes and we're done. Thank you. Appreciate you. Second Timothy. All right, now let's start from verse 6. Second Timothy 4 from verse 6. For now, this, we've said it here before, and I want you to think about these things. Many times when we read scripture, we forget that these were people, right? These were people like you and I, you know? All they just had was an encounter with God. This is the final letter that Paul writes before he dies. He knows he's about to die. How do we know this? It says, verse 6 says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. So he knows he's not leaving this prison. He wrote this from prison. He knows he's going to die here. And then that's what it says. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid before me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but to all who have loved his appearing. Verse 9. Do your best to come to me soon. For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Tessalonica. Thessalonica. How do you say that? Crescens. Okay, let's use that. <laughs> Has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me for ministry. Tasius, I have sent to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Capus at Thurs. Also the books, and above all the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did, did me great harm. He says, the Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Beware of him yourself, for he strongly opposed our message. At my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed. And all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. In his final letter, as he's ending, he's concerned about the preaching of the gospel. He's concerned that the Lord was able to use him even when he's in prison. What do you value, Christian? What do you value? You call yourself a Christian. Do you actually value what God wants? Do you actually value what the word of God says? Or do you value what you want and you want to tag God to it? This is what I want. By the name of God, I will get it. That is not the Christian of scripture. And if you're not using this as your standard, then where are you getting your definition of a Christian from? Where did this come from? I pray that today you will seek after what the Lord wants. I pray that today you will seek after what the word has said. Let us pray. I want you to open your mouth and just ask the Lord, Lord, help me to let go of my own perspectives. Let, help me to let go of my wants and help me to focus on you. Let me see what shall it profit a man if he gains this whole world. At the end, you lose your soul. What shall it profit a man if he gains his whole world? At the end, lose your soul. Jesus came to save men from the damnation that we have earned. It's not a question whether we see with this world, everything is crashing and burning. This is what happens when men are in control. Christ has come to save us. So are you walking with him or are you doing your own thing? Are you still in control? 
Is he in control or are you in control? Ask the Lord to help you. The Christian is different. Your value is different. There are many things that people would do you cannot do. You just can't do it because your value is different. What the, what the Lord has said is greater than what any man has said or would say. So you would say, I wouldn't do that because I am not of this world. I am here, but I'm not of this world. I'm different. There are suffering you will bear that no one else will bear because of him. At the end of this journey, would this life be worth it? Can you say at the end of all of this that this life was worth it? Like, you know what? It was worth it. Or when the end comes, will you be afraid? Ask the Lord to help you. And if you know that you don't have a relationship with Jesus, this is your time to give your life to the Lord. This is a time to give your life to the Lord. If you know you want to give your life to Jesus, you, ha- you don't have a relationship with him, why don't you just raise up your hand? If you know you want to give your life to Jesus. If you know you don't have a relationship with him, raise your hands. And if you believe you already have a relationship with Christ, you've already given your life to the Lord, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. You must ask yourself, is this me? The final prayer we're going to pray this morning is this. Father, help me to be like your son, Jesus. Help me to be like your son, Jesus. Everything Christ did was for the Father. Everything. Father, help me to be like your son, Jesus. The minute men stopped listening to the voice of God, we fell in the garden. The minute the word of God was no longer enough, we fell. The minute we found our own way, we destroyed everything. Father, help me to be like your son. What are the Christian values? Help me to be like your son. Help me to value what you value. Help me to love you in spite of everything around me. We thank you, Father, for all that you have done. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your word this morning. Father, we ask you, help us, help us, Lord, to live this life that is surrendered to you. Help us, Lord, to leave everything at the throne of grace. Lord, help us, Father, that we will not go seeking our own. Help us to seek after you. Father, that in our actions we'll be like your son, Jesus. In our speech we'll be like your son, Jesus. Father, help us to get rid of those things that we think are treasures but to you are abominations. Father, help us. We thank you, Lord, for all that you've done. For in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Glory.